Corey here with the Mentor and Engineer, and I've got my control panel for Tilly's Terror, our backyard coaster that's gonna have free inversions. Yes, it is math you can ride. And if you like this shirt, you can go ahead and get it from our merch store. Just scroll down below. Get yourself a copy right here. Boom. All right, so since we need to build such an elaborate control box, I wanted to give you 10 tips on how to make a great control box. So let's get started. Number one. So first off, we need to start with the correct box. This box is gonna be outside all the time, so we wanna get something that is rated for that. In our case, it is a NEMA 4 box. Uh, NEMA 4 is gonna have some characteristics, like it's gonna have sealed corners. A lot of boxes are just uh, formed sheet metal and they'll have a gap in the corner. So these ones are welded in the corners. It's also gonna have a lip all the way around so that it can seal with the seal on the door. And also when water comes in, it's gonna hit this channel and it's gonna run off to either side. It's got a lip so it can't just come right into the box. Number two. So you spend all this money on a great sealed box. The EMA 4 boxes are not cheap. And what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna put a bunch of holes in it. So all that water can just come right in. So this is where we need to get creative and do some simple things to not get water in your box. So, first thing, never under any circumstance are you to put holes in the top of your box. That's the sure way to get wired. But Corey, I have to put a hole in the top of the box for this sensor. Probably not. There's probably a way you can get around it. Uh, I know from hydraulic work, especially with hydraulic reservoirs, if you try to seal too many things on the top of a box, it, it just lets water in, and then you have, in our case, water and hydraulic oil mixing together. That's never a good thing. So the preferential place to put all your holes is the bottom. If you go look on a roller coaster brake run, you're gonna see some boxes there, and they all have wires running out the bottom. You rarely see one on the side, unless it's like a transfer uh, table where they actually have controls there. Uh, but yes, the bottom first, and then the sides are the next. So I'm gonna have at least an e-stop switch on this panel. I'm gonna have stuff coming out of the bottom. Putting some holes in this box, definitely for wires running out and switches on the door. I wanna make sure that everything I put in here has a rubber seal to keep water out. So I did find this awesome stack light for like four bucks. It is uh, not gonna be waterproof at all. So I could put some Teflon tape, and I probably will, around this thread here and thread the two together. And that gets me part of the way there. Uh, but as soon as you look at the base here, this base, uh, there's just no way to seal it. Uh, this is the outer seal and then all the rest of it is recessed. There are eight holes in it and then I'll have to run holes, uh, another hole for wire. I'm not gonna be able to seal this thing. So what I want to do is I'm going to mount it to something else and just run the wires in by themselves. Problem solved. Number three. The next thing is how do we drill these holes? So you probably bought this uh, really expensive uh, stepper bit right here. Uh, this one was uh, close to $50, I believe. And if you're not careful, they don't last long. So the key to making them last longer, and I mean like three times to five times longer, is to use lubrication while drilling. So get some tapping fluid, some uh, cutting fluid, or even just some WD-40 and keep spraying it on there. Any type of lubrication is gonna extend this bit's life. Number four. All right, the next thing is sealing your cables coming in. So you're gonna wanna get strain reliefs like this. And you're gonna wanna get ones that have rubber grommets in them so that they can make a very good seal. And then you'll tighten it down and it is sealed and it's, it prevents it from pulling out. Now the thing here is, this is a multi-conductor wire uh, for a prox switch, so there's four wires in there, and water can get in the end here. So anytime you split the cable apart, just know that water can get in. So you want this part to be in a sealed environment. In my case, the wire comes in here and it will be split apart and go to wherever it needs to go over here. On the other end of this, I'm using a sealed M12 uh, connector, which connects right to my sensor. So 
So I have no breaks in the wire and I don't have to worry about sealing this when I get over here. This is an advantage that you have over like a Deutsch connector where you have to split the wires out and then maybe you add heat shrink in after that. So consider using M12 connectors wherever possible. Number five. So in my box, I'm gonna have mostly a 12 volt system. I will have 120 volts uh, to charge the capacitor. I have the power supply. I've got the PLC that runs on 120 volts. So here in America, you can only work on a 24 volt system or lower while it's live. So I wanna abide by this, but I do have 120 volts. So I have capacitors that are being charged. I have power supply. The PLC itself runs on 120 volts. So I'm gonna abide by that by having a section down here with all the 120 volt stuff and it's gonna have its own cover that needs to be removed to access that. So all the 12 volt stuff will be exposed but the 120 volt stuff will still be covered. So as I mentioned in a previous video, I'm gonna have four banks of 10 capacitors making 24 volts in each bank. I'm gonna stack them together when I wanna use the coaster and that'll give me 96 volts. And then I'll unstack them if the door is open or if it's not being used. So that way it is OSHA approved. Number six. So e-stops are essential. There's two things you need to know. First of all, we always wire an e-stop switch to the normally closed part of the switch. That way when we run it to our PLC, we're always getting a signal when the switch is out. That way if we need to smack it, we lose that signal. So if we wired it the other way and we press the e-stop to get a high signal out, uh, if we went to press that and, and we didn't get a signal because of a broken wire, that would be very, very bad. So that's just poor design. Always run your e-stop so they're giving you a high signal in the off position or the extended position. The other thing about e-stops is you can wire them multiple ways. On a machine I once designed, it had six e-stops simply on the machine and another two located elsewhere. The two that were wired elsewhere went directly to their own input to the PLC and the six that were on the machine had a daisy chain, so we went from high to switch one, then switch two, switch three, switch four. And we only had one input on the PLC for all six of those switches. So it saved us PLC inputs. However, when we went to troubleshoot that, we had to make sure that all six were out and that took a while to walk around the machine. And if we still didn't get the e-stop signal, it was very difficult to find out which wire may be causing the problem. Wiring your e-stops with a daisy chain approach may save you some initial cost, but you may end up spending more time troubleshooting. Number seven. So in this box, all of your wires must be labeled. Yes, every one, both ends. Uh, I used to use these uh, peel and stick uh, labels right here. They're just, they're not good, they're cheap. You've already got some of the stick off of it and on your hand, then you gotta pull it again, then you gotta wrap it around. So it's lost a lot of stick before you even get started. What I recommend instead is getting a label maker and most label makers have uh, heat shrink tubing options that you can print a wire number right on there, slide it in the wire, heat shrink it on, and it looks fantastic. So go that route. Number eight. So when wiring a box, you want it to look pretty and be organized above all else. Nobody wants to see a whole bunch of wires in there. But as you have more and more wires, it get, tends to get messy. All right, so that's where wiring duct comes in. Wiring duct is this little fingered thing down here. You can run your wires in there and see that it's pretty messy. And then, like magic, you can put this thing on top. And look at that, it hides all those wires. So you just see these ones coming out. And then you get a little bit down there coming out. And it looks so much better. So use wiring duct. The next thing I recommend is having, for any wire that comes in outside of the box, goes directly to a terminal block. Now locating your terminal blocks may be a little bit more challenging, but I like to put all my uh, inputs and outputs uh, next to each other and then have a block for uh, like your positive and your ground. Now the reason for that is a sensor like this proximity sensor has a positive, a negative, and a signal wire. So inside the box, I need to break those out and make connections. 
What you might want to do is put like a positive block here and a negative block here, and then your signal's all coming there. Well, let's think about this a little bit. After I bring this in, I've got to split this and have enough length to split it out here and go there and there. If you decided to go with that, you may have to strip like 12 inches of wire back just to hit all three of those. So maybe a different way would be to have your wire come in and come down a rail in the middle in a wire duct. And maybe you have your positive here, your negative over here, and then your signals over here. That way maybe you only need to strip off about you know five to six inches and you can run it to either side and hit all of those very easily. Another application for terminal blocks is something like this. If I have these four wires coming off of this, this module here, I don't have the pins to connect this. So I can put in some uh, terminal blocks and have them screw right in right next to it. Just run them in right there. Last thing I love here is fuses. Fuses come in at terminal block sizes as well. This is a five by 20 millimeter fuse. Some of these you can get with LEDs in them so that when the fuse blows, it'll light up and you can see exactly which one uh, of your fuses is there. But these are great for circuit protection. Uh, you can put them for every common and I do that for every common uh, on the inputs and outputs. That way, I just don't have any issues with, with the power draw and my PLC is protected. Number nine. If you're using a panel with a human machine interface, HMI, be sure that you think ahead about one thing that bugs the crap out of me. And that is one spot on the panel being worn out. It's like every button has to be in that same location. Well, can you move the buttons around on the screen? Uh, very screen to screen like the enter maybe down here once and then up there the next time When you do this you make your panel last a lot longer and it just makes it look better overall So personally, I know that if I have one button that's gonna get pressed all the time on the same screen I'm gonna put that button remote. I'm gonna put it on the panel itself And then I will have the HMI just by point down to that button Not a big thing. It just makes your panel last a lot longer Hey, before we get on to the last one, please take a second to like, share, and subscribe. I hear that every time you like a video, it helps an engineer solve a calculus problem. So please, all those student engineers, give them a chance, okay? Hit that like button. Also scroll down and click that join button as well and help support the Tilly's Terror project and have that dream become a reality. You'll be part of something special. Number 10. All right, so the last one here is cleanliness. Cleanliness is next to godliness when it comes to PLCs. Any dirt, debris, shavings of steel, it all can just wreak havoc on your system, whether it's making a short and it shorts out your PLC or just one of those intermittent problems that uh, just keeps manifesting itself and you have no idea why, especially if you're dealing with like analog signals or low voltages. So proper cleanliness can help that. So as you get your box, you're gonna go ahead and lay out where you want all your switches to be. You're gonna drill your holes. And then the important thing is you're gonna clean this sucker up. You wanna suck all the big stuff out with a shop vac first and then go in with some Windex and some paper towels and do that. You may have to do it two, maybe even three times to get it clean. Now, the first thing that's gonna happen is someone's gonna come up to you five seconds after you finish and say, hey, we well, need another switch for uh, that over there. And you already got all your PLC and your power supplies and everything's wired. So what do you do? Well, if you're putting a switch in on the door, you can simply go ahead and close the door and then drill it right in there, right? No, don't do that. All right, make sure you have the door all the way open, as open as it can go. And then drill your hole while you're sucking out the debris as well. And then go ahead and clean it up. It's on the door, it's a lot easier if you don't get it in the main part of the box. Now, five seconds after adding that switch right there, somebody's gonna come up to you and say, hey, we need another sensor running in from the bottom. Can you drill us another hole? And of course you say, no, not gonna do that. We don't need that sensor, but you really do. So we're gonna need some supplies. We're gonna need that shop back again. We're gonna need the paper towels and the Windex. In addition to that, we're gonna need some uh, trash bags work great and some tape, usually like the blue painter's tape or something. 
And we're going to tape up everything so that no shavings of any type of steel get on the, the, the equipment. It's already there. Now, two-man job here. You're going to be drilling in, uh, usually from the bottom up, so that less shavings get in. And you're going to have somebody sucking from the top down. That will allow you to minimize the damage. And then you'll go ahead and clean it up with your paper towels and Windex again. So thanks again for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. Have a wonderful day.